Hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining us today. So yeah, let's talk about how we might solve divergence accommodation conflicts in augmented reality. Just for a quick background on who ID Tech X are, so I'm a senior technology analyst here, and we're a independent market research firm, and we look into a wide range of emerging technologies, including wearables and photonics, but you know, clearly a lot more areas shown on the slide there. And we provide reports, consulting, um, subscription services, and so on to help your business sort of profit from these areas of emerging technology. And I'm responsible for our coverage of virtual and augmented reality. So in this case, we have three off-the-shelf reports, including on optics and displays, which are kind of what I talked about today, but also a more general report covering the sort of industry uh, overall. Um, and I should just add that I'll put this code at the end if you want to ask me any questions there aren't time for. It might be easy just to connect me to me on LinkedIn. I'm also happy to send the slides over today. So sort of now I've gone through that preamble, I'll just sort of go through what I hope to answer in the talk. Um, so the first is, you know, a lot of you clearly already know, but what the emergence accommodation conflict is and why we care about it, what the impacts of it are. Then what are the possible approaches to solving it in augmented reality? And what are the, what are the challenges of these approaches? Why in particular is it challenging to solve this in augmented reality compared to virtual reality devices? And then I'll give a bit of an overview of which of these applications are most likely to succeed based on a bit of benchmarking. And just for real clarity here, when I'm talking about augmented reality, I'm talking about uh, devices which are optically see-through to the real world. I'm not talking about, for example, something like the Vision Pro or the Quest 3, which is a virtual reality headset with cameras to do MR pass-through. So just for real clarity about what I'm talking about today there. Um, and of course, the easy way to divide between these devices and what makes things more difficult in augmented reality is the optics and display system. So in VR, we typically have a display before the eye with some sort of lens system to magnify it and to focus it to a comfortable distance. Versus in augmented reality, we have something a little bit more complicated going on in terms of the overall architecture where we have our display system, some collimation objects, prediction objects, and then this critical component, the waveguide, or, which is a, or an optical combiner, of which waveguides are a subclass, which overlays this virtual information on top of the real world. And of course, we've already heard Dispelix talk about their products there, so that's just one example in that industry. And then we'll often have some sort of ancillary lenses to, for example, change that, uh, the focal distance from a waveguide or other combiner type to a comfortable point for the eye, to correct for um, eyewear prescriptions and so on. And this, this is gonna be a crucial area we'll talk about very shortly. So what is this emergence accommodation conflict then? Um, in, in our sort of 3D display systems, in, re, in many ways, we're sort of an evolution of technology that's been around for over, over 100 years at this point. Um, we have sort of a difference in parallax between images for the left and right eye, and then our eyes reassemble that into, a, our brains reassemble that into a 3D image. Um, but that image is actually the fixed focal point for each eye, um, and that can cause some problems like mismatch there. So in these systems, we have um, this vergence distance, so that's the perceived distance from where the eyes converge on these objects, not matching up to this accommodation distance, which you could also call the focal distance, because that display is being typically shown through some sort of fixed focus optics. Um, so if we fix a whole scene at a single accommodation distance from the eye, and we have these, um, this sort of uh, vergence distance varied, and we have a bit of a mismatch here, and this can lead to some significant consequences. So there are impacts on immersion, so virtual content feels less real, this is true in VR, but we have a particular issue in AR glasses where we're looking at delivering mixed reality capabilities since these virtual objects are appearing next to real ones, so it's a bit strange if you have an object sort of looking like it's two meters away, but you have to focus your eye at infinity to actually um, sort of interact with it when it's next to a real object, for example. Um, and of course, there's also an impact interaction. So it's been shown sort of quite conclusively that reaction speeds are slowed down and error rates increase. So for example, the hand alignment to uh, virtual objects by this vergence conversation conflict when we're looking at lateral interaction this way. Um, and of course, text reading speed and difficulty is, uh, is increased. So text reading speed is decreased rather. So legibility is a uh, worse. Again, you're not typically used to looking at text at infinity focus and if you're focus is fixed there, it's difficult, and at the same time, if we fix it close to the eye, then that impacts other areas of XR interaction, so striking that balance there is hard. And these, uh, for these formative points also impact on comfort, and this is the sort of most discussed area of where the virgin accommodation conflict has an impact. Um, it's sort of widely um, sort of shown to be 
contributing to the nausea and eye strain some experience in XR. Uh, these are at least amplified by the accommodation conflict, um, if not fully caused by it. So there is a limiting factor here in the prospects of XR. You know, clearly there are some ways around this, but I'm not saying this is sort of preventing XR from usable. That's obviously not true. But we do limit sort of the use cases uh, for some people by the sort of presence of this conflict. So I'm going to go through the potential sort of solution space now. I've kind of categorized this by level of sort of technology readiness, how near-term a solution it is, and also sort of how complete a solution it is. So looking at the kind of approach today we have, um, simply we'd use, we'd typically just using some sort of rendering workaround, so it'd perhaps we alter the shading, we may blur out of focus areas, and if you have eye tracking, then you can do that even more effectively. Um, you can offer these visual cues, but clearly this isn't really a solution. This is just sort of helping us to reduce our perceptions of emergence accommodation conflict. So it's not worth spending too much time on this now. This is what we do today. So let's move on to sort of the hardware and software-based solutions, which really sort of affect how this conflict impacts us. And the first is to look at focus-free systems, which are also sort of more scientifically known as max value and display systems. And this, in this case, the accommodation conflict uh, distance becomes irrelevant as the images and focus wherever the eye lens is. So effectively, we're, we're bypassing the eye lens and our display system. Um, and the best sort of known example here is uh, laser beam scanning displays for retinal projections. So in this case of our display system, we have the image built up by scanning a very, very uh, small laser beam dot over the eye and modulating the intensity of that beam. And if you can imagine if that dot is sufficiently small, then it doesn't really matter if my eye is focused at a close focal distance or at infinity that dot's going to be the same size. Um, so it doesn't matter where we focus the eye or if we have some issues with our eye lens, we can perceive an image. Um, and this is particularly helpful for things like um, translation, um, transcription and so on, where we, might, we want to actually interact with people around us so we're focused on different things, but we want to still have this information in front of us. So we're typically using these, display, we're quite commonly using these display systems in conjunction with a holographic optical element reflector um, to make our system very compact. And one of the more famous sort of commercial examples here was the Focals by North, and that company was acquired by Google a couple of years back. Um, and it, that was sort of aimed at similar use cases to what I talked about already, but sort of the, the real um, sort of impact in this is that Google's Project Iris AR glasses program looked to be using the same technology, although it's been claimed as of this summer that that project may be on hold, though there's some data to suggest, again, that they may, that may long, no longer be true. So. We're not quite sure about the prospects of that technology with Google at the moment. Um, but you know, Max Foley and LBS is excellent for um, these sort of utility use cases, these sort of mapping, translation, and so on. But we have an issue with our eye box, um, which is the area in which we can place our eye and comfortably perceive an image. Because we're effectively having to sort of focus, um, have this image coming over a very small area, smaller than the, um, smaller than the eye, than the eye's pupil in this case, in fact. Um, so we, we can't really move our eye around. We have to really quite highly customize the system to individual users. And it's not particularly well suited for binocular display systems, since if we can't really move our eye around, there's not much point in displaying a lot, a lot wide field of view, because the fovea is only really going to be able to perceive a very small area. So Max and LBS is great for text and notification content legibility, but it's not really a true version accommodation conflict solution. And it's of limited utility in binocular devices. So these are the sort of workaround solutions, we'll call them for now. They're great, they're helpful, but they're not really going to solve a problem fully. So looking more into the future now, um, we can look first at dynamic optics. Um, and here's a, here's an example of a picture from uh, Meta's uh, Project Cambria here, um, in which we're basically varying the focal length of our optics, dependent on where the user gazes. So if I'm looking at an object that's close or far away, um, using lenses or the optical combiner system. And although I put these in sort of a medium-term progression here, actually there is an industry example that has pre-existed here. Um, and that's actually the Magic Leap 1. So I probably don't need to explain what waveguides are to this audience today. But we, you know, we have a system where we're having, um, in this case, surface relief waveguides. We have some diffraction gratings, coupling light in, expanding light in, in the waveguide, and coupling light out. And one of the benefits of using these surface relief diffraction gratings compared to some types of waveguide coupler so that we can actually apply a lensing effect to the grating. So in the case of the Magic Leap 1, we had two sets of waveguide layers, if I remember correctly. One um, magnified, one focused the image at two meters from the user, um, and one at infinity. I may be misremembering those distances, 
and the uh, system could dynamically select between by illuminating the um, special light modulator in the display system from a different angle um, to basically provide a partial solution to the vergence accommodation conflict. Um, and that's sort of, as far as I'm aware, the only sort of uh, solution that's actually hit the market before um, in a AR device or any sort of XR device to sort of solve the vergence accommodation conflict. But we're probably also all aware of what happened to the Magic Leap 1, despite this sort of really impressive technological solution. And I think it's quite a good indicator of some of the issues that these solutions to the vergence accommodation conflict tend to bring up that we have to balance solving this, this conflict with the rest of the XR experience. So there's multiple trade-offs to be made, but one really quite significant one in the first Magic Leap device was the damage to the view of the real world. So we're looking through six-way laser waveguide plus their sort of cover glass plus any lensing effect and so on, but only two focal planes. Um, so that's six layers of diffraction grating because we have, um, which it's not, it's effective review of the real world. Um, it affects the, the sort of darkness that we can see through. It affects the image of the waveguides as well. It's really not a worthwhile compromise in that case. Um, and indeed, Magic Leap to, chose to abandon this in their second device, uh, which if you haven't had a chance to demo that yet, please do. It's really impressive. And there's a chance to do that today. Um, but, you know, this isn't the single consequence, and it's not unique to this device, that we, to this type of solution that we have this issue. So the other consequences include, of course, increased hardware complexity and cost. Um, this isn't unique to this type. This is, this is in general. I'll sort of broaden this out later. Often increased computational expense. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of having to change our rendering. We're changing the focal point. This is more, you know, computing is already a premium in our XR devices, particularly compact AR. We will need to manage that. And the final difficulty, which is really hard to deal with, in a lot of these systems, we have a reduction in spatial resolution um, and all the image quality, for example, through the introduction of artifacts. So really balancing these factors with the rest of the XR experience is a tough engineering challenge. So we'll look at the other sort of difficulty for AR in that if we're using waveguide combiners, as we widely expected to do in the future of um, AR devices, basically because we can make them look quite similar to glasses lenses and also they have this really sort of big eye box and a wide field of view compared to many other combiner types, we have a bit of a problem in that we usually, I should be clear, this isn't 100% um, true for every design, but almost always need collimated input light to our waveguide. So that means the light is at infinity, and of course if we're trying to portray objects which are close to the eye, that's a problem. Um, so it means that we can't easily focus, um, we can't easily focus through the projection objects where we have a sort of single lens system. Instead we have to, most sort of proposed solutions, instead focus at these ancillary lenses using verifocal lenses. And that means with the, um, we have to change the view of the real world and the virtual content. So that's two layers of lenses, two sort of additions of um, any aberrations and so on. Um, and also the lens thickness itself presents aesthetic issues. So I'll take, talk very briefly for a couple of proposed solutions here. Um, and one is sort of electronic varifocal lenses based on um, liquid crystal tunable gradient index cuneiform lenses. And I've chosen an example from is an Israeli company called Deep Optics. I'm aware of a sort of similar product from a company called Morrow Eyewear, which was an IMAX spin out. Uh, but um, Deep Optics is an Israeli company that's commercialized these um, green cuneiform liquid crystal tunable lenses in uh, verifocal eyewear. Um, and it told ID Tech X when we talked to them that it sees AR as a key future market. So these lenses are based pretty, are pretty much made on very similar lines to LCDs. Um, and there was a development project which with um, Loomis, which is an Israeli, a fellow Israeli firm producing reflective waveguides. It's not clear whether that's still in progress, but the idea was, as I said earlier, basically place one of these lenders either side of the waveguide to vary that focal distance and correct for vergence combination conflict. But kind of a more sort of talked about solution in VR in particular is geometric phase lenses. So this is something else based on uh, liquid crystals. We effectively have a metasurface um, which, depending on the sort of the polarization handedness of input light, becomes either a positive or a neg negative lens. So if we pair these with switchable wave plates, we can produce a lens which has multiple focal lengths with no moving parts and there's very, very limited latency there. Um, it's pretty much instantaneous as long as we can switch those wave plates very quickly. Um, so Meta has shown off prototypes there for use in VR, so using other lens there. And Valve also has work there. Apple has some patent activity in this area, but we think it's probably of relatively limited relevance to AR. 
um, because we have this issue with basically really quite high thickness lenses. Um, you know, for a VR lens, we're pretty, we're pretty slim, but for an eyewear lens, we're kind of not sufficiently slim. So apart from maybe some sort of really high, um, sort of high end early devices focused on sort of high end training, these might be relevant, but we wouldn't expect them to be used perhaps in a consumer device because simply it looks like they're not going to be able to be possibly made slim enough. And we also have this issue with, for example, um, a yellow tint due to the um, conductive film materials used in the switchable wave phase. So there are some issues here that make them great for VR, but maybe not so good for, for AR, despite the sort of higher level of technology readiness. So looking at the sort of other longer term solution type is the use of what we call true 3D displays. So it's kind of a broad, broad categorization, but we're primarily talking about holographic and light field displays, which approximate a true 3D scene. Um, so we're not, we're not having to use eye tracking, uh, at least to anything like the same extent, to um, sort of vary the focus. We actually are rendering a 3D scene from the display itself. And one of the more talked about examples here is um, a Swiss company, I, I believe I'm pronouncing this correctly, is C-Reels um, light field display. So we have actually, in this case, a Maxwell M display system, but we show multiple views of the scene sequentially. Um, so we can imagine looking at from different sort of perspective points. These are overlaid very quickly at 1600 hertz. Um, and so they sort of overlay and the eye then is able to actually focus on these sort of overlaid images. Um, it uses sort of off-the-shelf um, light, um, off-the-shelf spatial light modulators in conjunction with um, sort of customized projection um, optics. And the big news in this area is that Serial has actually announced um, as of last month that its AR display system is ready for integration by early next year in terms of that IP being licensable. Um, although sort of a progress from that to the commercial product isn't clear, and I should point out there is a little bit of a limitation as far as we can tell in the field of view of this, um, of this type of system. Um, and we also have some effects on the spatial resolution. So these are kind of a downside in this area. I need to speed up a bit because um, I'm getting a bit sort of low on time. So looking very, very briefly at holographic display systems, we're um, effectively, in this case, displaying a image through a, um, a computer-generated hologram using a spatial light modulator to the eye. And one of the most sort of publicly talked about companies in this area for AR in particular is a Cambridge UK-based firm called VividQ. Um, there's a, pro a photo of one of their older prototypes using their bio optics there. Um, and a benchlock prototype. So you know, it's, it's a holographic image. It's in focus at all distances. Um, and they actually, earlier this year, announced in conjunction with Dispelix that they have worked out a way to integrate this with um, surface relief diffractive waveguides. We do see some significant issues in terms of holographic speckle, which effectively degrades the image quality and arguably affects the um, spatial resolution, depending on how you mathematically quantify it, um, but are quite difficult to solve. And the real issue being just the computing power to generate these holograms in real time, it uses incredibly large. So all of these solutions in this space, whether it be a true solution or a workaround, do have quite significant issues that um, affect their use. So I'm going to very quickly compare these. Um, so to compare these, I've chosen a few sort of useful benchmark factors. Clearly, in a full report, these would be more, but just to sort of give them a, a, at a glance. The commercial readiness sort of explains itself, how close this technology is to commercial availability. Again, the cost explains itself. But these other factors, such as immersion potential, I looked at here, does the design offer a wide field of view and eye box? Um, the image quality, oh, clearly that takes on a lot of factors, but how does that affect the images transmitted through it in terms of aberration, spatial resolution, artifacts, noise, and so on? Um, the social acceptability potential, can this be integrated into a relatively small device? Uh, does it affect the view of the outside world? Um, into, can it work in an attractive, comfortable headset? And finally, is it a complete solution? So this sort of results chart includes the incomplete solution of Maxwellian LBS. So I'll sort of exclude that from the discussion right now, just for the sake of time. We're looking at just the full solutions. Um, in terms of the overall benchmarking scores, we can see a few things. Um, in terms of our, our rank totals, we'd expect that these liquid crystal green cuneiform lenses um, offer sort of maybe the best shorter term solution in this regard. Um, simply because there's sort of a relatively there's a sort of relatively higher level of commercial readiness at the moment, um, the immersion potential is relatively good, um, and the effects on image quality um, are, are are pretty limited compared to some other types. In com um, we put geometric phase lenses and light field displays kind of in the same level, despite the higher commercial readiness of light field displays. 
we'd expect the effect on image quality of geometric phase lens arrays to be lower, so that's why they sort of rank similarly. Um, and at the bottom at the moment, largely just due to that kind of lower commercial readiness, we've placed holographic displays. Um, and also the, the, the computing power, despite the really impressive images produced, the requirement for that is quite high. So that was a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, I guess of his potential solutions to the vergence accommodation conflict in AR. But one thing I should really point out is we expect the solution to come up in VR first. There's a lot less technical challenges in terms of the optical design. Um, and we don't basically have quite the same con constraints on compactness and social acceptability. So we'd expect that solution to come there first. Um, and we have to trade these solutions off with other parts of the AR experience for themselves, despite the sort of quick speed of advancement in this field, they're not yet technologically optical, uh, optimal. Um, and we tentatively suggest that liquid crystal gradient index cuneiform lenses and light field displays are the most likely solutions to succeed in the medium term. But we wouldn't expect wide deployment for over a decade is simply due to the sort of currently relatively um, early stage of this market and the technical challenges that I've already highlighted. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm not sure if there's going to be time for any questions, unfortunately, but if you do have any, please do feel free to catch me afterwards, and I hope you are... Uh, learn something about the potential solutions to the various accommodation conflict in AR. Thank you. Thank you.